All right, so um, a bit of a maybe a lighter talk for now, and uh, it's this is more for people who are beginners in, in Scala who wants to get introduced with Scala. So if you already a Scala expert, you might want to, you know, wait for the last slides when maybe hopefully it's a bit interesting. Um, okay, so so what is this talk about? So we're going to um, solve Sudoku using uh, functional idioms in Scala, and hopefully. You know, if you don't know Scala well, you might learn something. A uh, bit of a disclaimer, I'm not really a Scala expert, I'm more of a Java person, but I kind of like to do function programming, so I do a bit of Haskell and Scala on the side, more of a hobby. Uh, the original idea actually was kickstarted from a, uh, another Scala uh, meetup by Anton Loss, and we worked together, and then I made a presentation out of this. It's, it's not meant to be fast, it's really meant to be uh, a teaching tool to show how little code you can write and actually solve something. <coughs> And it does not solve the hard grids. And actually, I don't know how much you know about Sudokus, but the easier grids, you can solve them using logic, by using uh, inference. But when you go into the hard grids, you cannot. You need to be making guesses, and you need to be backtracking, and then you need to have good heuristics. So this is just pure inference. All right, so uh, probably everyone knows what a Sudoku is here, but just in case, it's a 9 by 9 grid. And the goal is to fill the grid with numbers uh, from 1 to 9. And there are just three rules. The first rule is that all of the rows must, must have all of the numbers exactly once. The second rule is that it's the same for columns. And the third rule is that it's the same for squares. So we have nine, these nine squares here. They all have to have the same. So using these three rules, we solve the, the Sudoku. So that's the introduction to Scala features, uh, if, if you need. So the first uh, thing is a trait. So for Java people, it's a bit like an interface. And the advantage is that we can um, you know, we so, so here I have an example, I have a shape, and I define two case classes, which are my implementations of my trait. And, you know, if I compare this to Java here, I don't have to write any uh, getters and constructors, everything is done for me. Uh, it's an immutable data, data, tru data structure, which is uh, quite important and useful. Um, so here I can have a circle or rectangle. A circle has one parameter and a diameter, and a rectangle has um, two parameters. And then I can use pattern matching on that trait. Uh, so instead of, if, again, if I keep comparing to this to Java, in Java we might have an abstract method that we implement in these two classes, but in Scala, I think in the functional world, they prefer to, to take this out of the class and they use pattern matching. So e here I have a method that um, takes a shape and I want to um, just return some message to describe uh, the shape and I can do a pattern matching with the case here and actually I, the interesting thing is I get a bit of a lambda here that I get access to the variables of the case class and I can use them in the function. So here I can use the, the circle and then the rectangle and um, this is actually code that is, uh, I use the, um, the tooth plugin that actually runs that code in the presentation. So here if I have a, a circle, it shows me circle. If I have a rectangle, it's a rectangle. So as I said, it's immutable, it's, it does a lot of things for me. Very useful. This um, solver is using the vector library, so I always look at this. Uh, so basically this is the uh, performance of the different libraries across different operations, and EC means effective constant time. So I look at this and I'm like, stack magic or what? I don't know if anyone knows why, how it works, maybe some people, but as a user I'm like, I'm going to use this for free, why not? Uh, it just it means it's just fast everywhere, so cool, I like that. Um, the first operator we're going to use is the filter operator, it might sound it's easy for everyone, but if I have a vector of type A and I can pass it a predicate, it's not exactly a predicate, but yeah, kind of, that's a function from A into Boolean and it returns a new vector that will have the same amount of less um, elements. So if I have a vector 1, 2, 3, if I pass a filter that check if the number is even, I'm only getting the vector with just the not one element 2. So does what it, the, I mean, it does what it says, it filters. Um, the map operator is, you know, pretty obvious as well. We have a vector of type A and then a function from A to B and we get a new vector of type B. So in my example, I use the same type, but, you know, I have vector 1, 2, 3. If I map it with the function times 2, I get vector 2, 4, 6. Uh, so now is the flat map. So, you know, we uh, talk about monad and, uh, you know, that's a, I, I, when I was starting, it used to confuse me what's the difference between map and flat map, but, you know, then got into monad. Um, yeah, so this is almost the same thing, except that the signature is slightly different. Instead of a function from A to B, it returns a function from A to vector of B. So if I was just to use the map, I would get a vector of a vector. I don't want this. I want to flatten it. This is where the monad decomposition kicks in. And I get, just, I get back to where I started. So if I had a vector 1, 2, 3, 
and I passed a function that, um, that duplicates uh, the elements. Fortunately, I have to scroll here. That's amazing. <laughs> And, uh, and in the end, instead of getting a vector or a vector, I get just a vector, and I get one, one, two, two, three, three. So, no, so that's the the one. There's, it's not difficult, but maybe I need to be a bit slow, and uh, because once you get it, it works. But all right. So here I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit more, and um, I'm gonna imagine I have a matrix. So a matrix, you can essentially model it two ways. You can say you have a list of columns or a list of rows. So here I use vectors. So um, here I model it by a vector of rows. So here I write my matrix. I write four rows, and then I create a vector of this. So I have a vector of vector. So a vector of rows. But now, what if I wanted to isolate one of the squares? So here my squares are a size four. Well, the thing I can do is I can use the group operator. So in this case, what it's going to do is it's like a big, big knife. It's going to chop my matrix in two and give me two matrices. So the type of this is the list of vector of vector. So I have a list of matrices, two matrices. One is the top half, the other one is the bottom half. So here I've done this just to illustrate. If I called group by two, I'm getting two matrices. So we have the first one, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I have another matrix that has nine, 10, 11, and 13 to 16. And I can use that if I want to target one of the squares. So if I give them a column index and row index, and I have some variables and I want to target. So imagine I want to target the uh, row index 1 and column index 0. So that's this one here. I want to get 9, 10, 13, 14. So what do I do? I take my already uh, chopped. So my G here is my grouped. And I give it the row index. So that basically, this is a bit like a binary search. I, I'm going to select which half I want. So I use the row index. Row index is 1, so I'm going to be in the second half. So now I have bottom half of the matrix, but I don't want these guys. So what I can do is I can, what I should be doing is I sh should call the group operator again on the individual rows. And we've just seen that we can use that with flat map. So if I do a flat map on this, I'm getting a handles on the rows. So if I then group the rows and call the column index, I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to get one vector here and one vector here. And if it was map, I would get vector or vector. But because it's a flat map, I'm just getting vector. Um, so in the end, I'm not sure if you can see here, but this returns 9, 10, 13, 14. And we're going to be using this in the Sudoku later. Another thing that I wish we had in Java is tuples. <laughs> just you know, put them in bracket. You get a tuple, and you can very easily access the elements using underscore notation. I don't know why we don't have this. Um, <coughs> Next one is zip with index. So that is going to, from my Sudoku, this is going to be able to give me the coordinates of my different cells in my Sudoku. So if I have a vector ABC, if I do a zip with index, I'm going to get a tuple of the elements with the, along with the index in which they are. So A0, B1, C2. Straightforward as well. Now, transpose operator. So you might remember this from your algebra lessons, but it basically, flips the matrix. So if I have a matrix which is uh, you know, one row with two elements, I get a matrix with one column, two elements. If it's a square matrix, I'm flipping the matrix around the diagonal. But more important conceptually for us is that I said that a matrix it can either be a vector of columns, and it can be a vector of rows as well. And basically, the transpose is what is, uh, is, the, f is, the, is, the, is the gateway between these two, mo these two models. So if I have uh, this matrix here, which I've modeled as a matrix of rows. So I have, um, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If I transpose it, I'm getting 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6, which is basically my two columns. So the transpose operator allows me to look at my matrix in two different views. I can either access the rows or I can access the columns. So now we have all of the building blocks. We can actually get to write some useful code. Um, so we talked about uh, traits. So First, we need to model the cell of a Sudoku. So this is the only really, I, I mean, it's the, it's the biggest uh, modeling decision in this. In this. But, uh, so, I, so I have a trait cell. And basically, we have two cases. Either we know which uh, number belongs into the cell. So either it's because this number was given to us uh, on the journal, uh, in the Daily Mail, which we all love, or, uh, it was, or it's uh, unknown. And if it's an unknown, I'm calling, I'm calling it undetermined. And this K class has a list of values that are allowed in that cell. So when I start, I'm going to have either a fixed cell with a number 
or an embeddement with all the numbers from 1 to 9. And my job will be to try to shrink that guy to reduce the possible value using inference and then hopefully convert everything into a fixed. And when everything is a fixed, I've solved my problem. And a Sudoku grid will be modeled as a vector of vector of cell. So a matrix of cells. That's straightforward as well. So now we had the cell, so we're going to model the Sudoku itself. Well, the Sudoku is also a case class that has a grid, which is a vector of vector of cells. And I said the Sudoku has three rules, so we implement three methods. The first method is to tell me if value is allowed in a row, value is allowed in a column, and value is allowed in a square. And these methods have all have the same signature. I apologize for the scrolling. And, and um, the signature is give me a position in your matrix, so column, row, give me a value, and I'll return you a boolean to tell you if you can put this one. So can I use number three in this square? Yes, no. And three of these methods will give um, the different answer depending if they're looking at the row rule, the column rule, the square rule. So the, the row rule is pretty straightforward. As I said, you cannot have twice um, the same number in a row. So if you want to know if you can put a number in a specific place, you just need to check that if it already exists. So you take your grid, position uh, underscore uh, one is the uh, row, so I get the row, and then I just check, does the row contain a fixed of that value? And I return, so if it doesn't contain a fixed of that value, then it means this number is not in the row, it means I can put it here. If it's there, then no, I can't. Now, for the column it's very similar, except that it's for the columns, and we don't have the columns. Well, we do, because we can use the transpose. So first, I take my grid, I transpose it, so now, instead of having rows, I have columns. So by using position underscore two, which is the column number, now I'm getting my column. And again, I just checked. I just check if it contains a fixed. So very similar to the row, except that it's using um, a transpose. And the square would be slightly difficult, but we already done all of the groundwork for it. I'm going to use the grouping, grouping operator. So first, we need to establish which square we want to look at. So we can just do a, a, a Euclidean division on the on the x and y position in the grid. So now I have my, my, um, my square numbers from 0 to 2, each of them. So again, I do my sort of binary search. First, I split my grid in, th in, my, my grid in three. So I have the, the top half, the, mid, uh, sorry, the top, top group, the middle group, and the bottom group. And I select which one I want to go depending on my position. So now I will have this basically this layer where I want. But in this layer, I will only want certain paths. So what do I do again? It's the, exactly the same code as we've seen. I do a flat map. On that row, I group it by three, I split, I get the one type, um, I use the bit I want, I put everything together using the flat map, and in the end, I'm just getting a simple vector with all of my cells, and again, I just check, do you have a fixed value? And this is it for the logic. So just for simplicity, I just wrap all of these into one method that just says, is value allowed? And it's going to check for all of the rules. And this is now the last slide. Um, and it's very annoyed that it's scrolling. I should have checked this before. I'm very sorry. Um, so <coughs> this is the method, a method in the class Sudoku. And you know, in Scala, we like to do things immutable. So it's, a, it's going to return. So it, so it belongs in the Sudoku class. It's going to return a new Sudoku, which hopefully is, is progressing towards the solution. So what do, what, do we, what do we do? Well, we start with the grid here. This is my grid. It's my attribute in my case class. And I zip it with index. I need to do this because you know, all my methods, they have uh, positions, and I want to know. So I need to kind of get my, my column number. So I do a zip with index, then I do a map. Basically, this map is literally just to give me a pattern matching. So now I have my row and my row index. Have the job done. So now if I zip my um, row again with index, now when I do a map, I will be able to access the column index. And basically, I'm in this solving phase, I'm only interested in the cells that haven't, uh, have, that haven't guessed yet. So I'm only interested in the case where it's undetermined. If it's, if it's anything else, which is fixed, just uh, return the cell unchanged. And here, to progress, what I need to do, I need to shrink the possible, the allowed values in that cell. And to do the shrinking, we already seen that we have the uh, filter operator. So what do I do is that here, I returned a new undetermined cell. But these times, I take the old values and I filter them. And I pass my is value allowed um, method, was conveniently was a predicate. So I gave it the row index, apologies, the column index and the value. And this basically will reduce 
the values in that cell and then I return it. And now we need to be careful that if we do this, it's, it's never going to, uh, to, to finish because we also need to check if we reach the point where we have an undetermined cell which has value of size 1, it means we've done a job for this one, we need to convert it into a fixed a cell of value. Uh, fixed, fixed cell with the number that was in the, the, the single number that was in the list. And that was my new, my new grid. And now I check something. I just check, is my filtered grid is the same? So that means I haven't progressed. So there's two, two cases. Either I found the solution, and it's happy, happy days, or it means I couldn't progress anymore and means that it's a Sudoku that I couldn't solve. And this, this solution cannot distinguish the two. It just means I haven't made any progress, so I'm stuck, or I won. If it's not the case, then I recursively, I create a new Sudoku with the filtered, and I recursively call the filter method. And that's it, that's the end. Um, so the slides and the code is uh, all on GitHub. Um, I mean, they're a bit more, especially around parsing, there's a bit more uh, um, sugar, um, you know, a bit more work around parsing. And there is a, a tool that you can, a command line tool that generates a lot of Sudoku. So I, I've generated hundreds of them. Um, and I've tested against that, and I think I have the performance here. Yeah, it was about fi um, fi 50 grid a second, kind of. So, oh, I mean, on the simple grids. If you give it uh, more than simple, when you, when you need to make guesses, it doesn't work anymore. So, if we don't have time for questions, then we can just carry on later. <laughs>